afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Center for Critical Thinking webinar, part of a series of, on challenges facing Southwest Florida in the context of issues of national and global significance. My name is Charles Capcella. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Center for Critical Thinking, and I will be serving as the moderator. It would be hard to overstate the impact of the COVID pandemic on our world. There have been over 100 million of our fellow human beings directly afflicted. Nearly 3 million died. <clears throat> and the grief felt by loved ones has been emotionally overwhelming. So throughout this year, life has changed for all of us. And we're only beginning to realize the full impacts of isolation, the stress, and reality of financial worries and problems, in addition to those health issues that still are the subject of some unanswered uh, questions. The session this afternoon focuses on the impact of COVID-19, specifically on higher education, and even more specifically, its impact on Florida Gulf Coast University, and how it has had to adjust to that impact, and how the impacts have led to other broader impacts, all the while looking ahead to a long-term future that's clearly going to be different. This focus on higher education deserves some consideration for a number of reasons. And among them is, uh, are that higher ed is a, a significant economic engine for this nation and certainly for the college towns and communities where they reside. And speaking of both re the research output of these universities as well as their role in creating tomorrow's leaders. There are uh, nearly 6,000 post-secondary institutions in America serving more than 15 million students. Uh, and higher education itself is a multi-billion dollar enterprise uh, employing millions of people. We're fortunate to have as our speaker today a distinguished, experienced university president, one who has led our own Florida Gulf Coast University through the challenges of COVID-19. Let me tell you just a little bit more about Dr. Martin, and he in turn will tell us a little bit more about Florida Gulf Coast, its experience in dealing with the pandemic and from there on to the broader impact of, of uh, COVID on the higher ed uh, enterprise throughout Florida and the world. Dr. Mike Martin is FGCU's fourth president. He came to the university from Colorado State University where he served as chancellor. And before that, he served as chancellor at Louisiana State University and as president of New Mexico State University. He served in faculty positions over a 15 year career before these administrative roles. And so he's seen uh, higher education up close from east to west and from north to south and would therefore have a unique perspective on American higher education as an enterprise. Dr. Martin is a native of Crosby, Minnesota. He holds degrees in economics from Mankato State University and a doctorate in applied economics from the University of Minnesota. A footnote, we're gonna hold questions. You can add questions at any time during the presentation. They'll appear on our, they'll be on the question part of the, your screen and we'll address them at the conclusion of Dr. Martin's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Mike Martin. Thank you very much, Dr. Bud Kupchel. I very, very uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's an honor and I'm pleased that you, but you folks have taken the time to give us all a chance to reflect on what's happened over the last uh, year now with respect to managing through this particular challenge and challenging time in higher education and beyond. I think you do know, most people in Southwest Florida know something about FGCU, but let me just remind you of a few factoids. We are now just about 24 years old, having been founded in the late 90s our original president, uh, Roy McTarnigan, is still with us, and he uh, remains engaged in the university. Uh, we are the one of 12 public universities in the state system. There are also 28 state colleges, but we're one of the 12 universities in the system that includes uh, the big boys in terms of size, like Central Florida and UF and FSU. Uh, we're, we're a regional comprehensive and meaning that we uh, offer a wide bandwidth of degrees, but we focus a great deal of our attention on serving Southwest Florida, 
Uh, we try to design all of our programs in such a way that any student that completes one can go wherever he or she chooses, but can stay in Southwest Florida if that's their choice as well. And so we now have uh, about 58 undergraduate degrees, about 18 uh, graduate degrees. We're adding certificate programs and relationships with the local major employers so that our students get to get a jump start in their businesses and we can help improve uh, continually the workforce that's here working with them. It's an interesting university in that we are about 33% Pell eligible students about 40% first generation students and slightly over 60% of our students work part-time to be able to afford to attend FGCU. I think we're remarkably efficient because we've managed to keep the cost of attending this institution very much under control. But like every other place, this uh, pandemic has stressed us all financially. It's stressed the institution, it's stressed our students, it's stressed their parents, it's stressed our, stressed our faculty and staff financially and in many other ways. Uh, as you all know, uh, we are here in one of the more vulnerable geographies or, or regions of the country. I, I think Charlotte County is one of the oldest counties in the country, certainly in Florida, and Lee County and, and, and Collier County are fairly uh, advanced in age on average, at least as well. I, I count myself as one of those uh, senior citizens here. But that means obviously that we have an intersection with a population that has been incredibly vulnerable during this pandemic. And in the light of the fact that 60% of our students work in the community, we had to think uh, pretty seriously about how we not only cared for our students, but how they came to understand that they needed to care for the community. Uh, as you may know, if you've been on our campus, and if you haven't, I invite everyone to come and visit. It's not a campus that was well attuned to dealing with a pandemic in that the campus is very compact. It was intended in its design to bring people together rather than separate them. And it was intended as well to have small class sizes. So we don't have massive uh, lecture halls that lend themselves and our management to significant social distancing. So when this thing blew up uh, about a year ago, slightly, slightly more than a year ago, we had to think very carefully, very creatively about how to continue to offer quality degrees in light of the various challenges that we face that are maybe not individually unique, but collectively unique for many of our sister institutions. So here's what happened, just so you understand. Uh, Mid-March of <clears throat> 2020, along with the rest of the country pretty much, and certainly along with, with the other institutions of Florida, over a three-day weekend, we converted from a traditional campus to an entirely online campus. And that came with some huge, huge challenges in and of itself. First, because we are just 25 years old or 24 years old, many of our faculty call themselves the founding faculty. They were here from the beginning and uh, they're wonderful folks. They themselves are getting into that age where they were vulnerable to the pandemic, but also they are of the age, and I fully appreciate this, where converting to technology was not a particularly easy task. So we did find initially that there were some pretty big bumps in the road in getting faculty who had spent their careers in rather traditional classroom settings in a three-day weekend to flip their entire approach to teaching to online. One of the things we did to help solve that problem is we actually hired students to help the faculty teach students. And it's worked out pretty well. Um, a number of faculty in, in the end said, <clears throat> how much they appreciated the assistance from a group of students who were very comfortable with the very technology they were trying to master. We also, of course, had to throw some significant resources at our uh, technology group on campus. We had to uh, retrofit classrooms very quickly. We had to create new ways to socially distance. We required and continue to require that everyone wear a mask on campus. 
Uh, even those of us who are vaccinated believe we should always wear a mask for two reasons. It's got a health implication, obviously. And I've told the students, this is the way by all wearing a mask that we show we're all on the same team. It's our kind of uniform. It's our commitment to one another graphically displayed. So we flipped uh, to an online program entirely in March. And among the things we had to figure out along with how to deliver coursework was how we could cope with the fact that now we probably and legitimately believe we owed the students refunds on residence hall fees, on uh, meal plans and the like. And again, going back to the fact that we're only 25 years old and very different from our sister institutions, we do not yet own our residence halls and our parking garages in particular. Many of the buildings have been built on campus either through donors or the state, but the residence halls and the parking garage, in particular parking garages, are all still bonded. So we were trying to provide <laughs> refunds to students while we were simultaneously recognizing that we had to meet our bond commitment on the very buildings they were moving out of. The reason we were adamant and the first in the state to announce that we would refund in the residence halls is we knew how badly we needed to have those students return to us in the fall. The other thing that we learned in the process is that uh, from the outset, we underestimated the length that this pandemic would last. So like many of our sister institutions, we made promises and commitments that almost immediately became impossible to fill. For example, we did cancel commencement last spring, a year ago, but we announced that we would have a traditional summer commencement in August, which was impossible by August. Then we all announced we would do a commencement in December. Again, we couldn't pull it off and on and on, we continually tried to keep people engaged and enthused while recognizing that uh, as it struck us that it turned out that this is gonna be longer than we thought. As I suggested, the campus is pretty compact. So we spent some time early on as we anticipated fall and bringing people back in some form of a normal campus. We analyzed the campus very carefully about how we could socially distance and still provide some face-to-face -face, uh, instruction. We concluded that we could uh, occupy the campus 28% of its capacity at any one time. And so in doing so, we established, as everyone did, three means of delivering coursework. Some traditional face-to-face, -face, some completely online, and some blended combination of those two. As a result of that, we were able to uh, provide face-to-face, -face, some face-to-face -face instruction for 72% of our students. All who chose that they want, or let us know that they wanted some face-to-face -face could get some. Most of those courses were blended, uh, about 10% were entirely face-to-face because -face they had to be given the nature of the subject matter, but everything else went into a blended, we called it a blend flex model. And so that was one of the things we, spent the summer really getting up to speed on to see if we could manage our way through the into the fall again hoping that by winter we would be returning to something that looked very much like fall or winter of 2019. Um, so that was part of the big big challenge as i suggested we had the uh, commitment we made a commitment to all our students that we would try to that we would stick to four principles if i can share that we had four principles. We put together a response team immediately and we met daily for a while. Now we meet twice a week. But that response team concluded that we had four overarching principles that we would employ as we went forward into the fall and beyond. We would protect the health, well being, and safety of our students, faculty, staff, and our neighbors. We would deliver the highest quality academic programs we possibly could under the circumstances. We would continue to invest in and build out the campus infrastructure for the long run. And we would protect as many jobs as we possibly could. We did put some people on some short-term leaves. We did allow a number of faculty and staff to work remotely. 
but we also tried to provide something that felt like a real campus and a real set of programs. As I say, our students uh, rose to the occasion. We were able to return to campus, uh, actually a slight increase in enrollment and a slightly larger increase in credit hours taken. We uh, needed, <laughs> quite honestly, to hit 83% residence hall occupancy rate to meet our bond obligation and we hit 84%, which turned out to be the highest in the state. So we were able, because I think we created a relationship with our students that gave them confidence that we would treat them well if they chose to sign up for the residence halls again. As it turns out, 84% was a good number for us because it left us open to having space for isolation and quarantine if we found students who tested positive. And we've found students that tested positive, as I'm sure you know. We uh, enforced very early on the basic guidelines that were given to us by CDC. And among those, we discouraged and in some cases penalized student organizations for violating social distancing or maskless meetings. A couple of fraternities, a sorority, a few other organizations had to be modestly sanctioned for breaking the rules we knew they knew were in place. I had to always have, as you know, in this society and this community and elsewhere, continual debates with various students and others about the mask mandate. I was told on a number of occasions that it was against their constitutional right for us to mandate that they wear a mask. So I actually began carrying around a copy of the constitution and asking them to show me in the constitution where that was specified. I also asked the question, if, you, if it's your constitution, constitutional right not to wear a mask, is it your constitutional right not to wear pants and a variety of other things? So we had some interesting conversations on campus, but by and large, people got on board. They uh, accepted the reality. They participated uh, constructively. We hired a group of students to be ambassadors, and that is to check on their fellow students to ensure they're wearing the mask and not give them one, to remind them about social distancing. We have an app we all still fill out every morning that reports whether or not we've had any exposure to someone with COVID-19, whether we're experiencing any symptoms so we can track people. We then intervene. We set up our own testing system. Initially, it was the slower mechanism, but we now have both uh, the rapid turnaround nasal and the rapid turnaround uh, oral uh, testing, saliva testing, so we can know pretty quickly we shut down most of intercollegiate athletics in the fall, uh, both following NCAA as well as our own conference guidelines. We are now incidentally trying to play many fall sports in the springs. It's stressing out our facilities a bit, but so far we've been pretty successful in managing our way through that. So those are some of the things that, uh, that we've had to do and continue to do. Again, we assume that by winter semester, we would feel a little closer to normal, but winter semester ended up looking very much like fall. We stuck pretty much to our, our blend flex approach. We stuck pretty much to uh, allowing students to do entirely distant distance. Uh, as you may know, several of our programs really do require internships or experiential learning, particularly in the health sciences. And obviously teachers have to student teach. So we've had to manage our way through that. You may know that we require every student to do 80 hours during their time here of community service. We've had to be creative about how we help them find community service obligations to take up and opportunities. Uh, many, uh, maybe a, a great many, but several protested, they wanted us to waive that requirement. We still believed it was important to do and we helped them find ways to do it, whether it was tutoring uh, a grade school student online, uh, helping out with a nonprofit with some technological assistance, whatever it is. We tried to find a way that we would not violate the standards that we believe are important to an FGCU degree. 
So that's some of what we've been up to. It has been stressful in that many of the students who are dependent on working in the community have not been able to work as much as they did in the past. We have been fortunate that we've received some CARES Act money. And from that, we were able to help cushion the blow on refunds and to offer students the opportunity to apply for special needs assistance from that money. And I think we invited 11,000 students who qualified for it and we funded about 9,000 with some grant uh, back to them to help them deal with the stress. We're expecting some more CARES Act money. I think there are two more different rounds coming and we're awaiting definition on what we could do with them though we expect that some portion of it will indeed be directed toward relief to students. I've been uh, very impressed with the students who uh, have applied because they all knew that there was an upper limit, but most of them didn't apply for the max because they made a case for what they genuinely felt they needed and we were able to help them out some. So that's been, that's been remarkable. Uh, among the other things that we've seen is uh, continued support from the community uh, in every possible way. Our donors and others have stepped up to help our students out. Uh, we have a food pantry on campus. We, knowing that some students are under stress, we've had an enormous burst of contributions to the food pantry. Uh, so uh, in, in probably as many ways as we can measure it, we feel as though we manage this well. The team we put together to respond, and as I say, we're meeting regularly, have really risen to the occasion. And one of the, one of the benefits to me that's come from the pandemic is I've discovered some people on this campus who work kind of in obscurity, who have stepped up in ways I would never have imagined and have just done remarkably good work on behalf of this institution and its students. So you do learn some things. Uh, and I've learned as well, don't make promises that you're not absolutely certain you can keep. We can continue. One of the things that's been most stressful, interesting enough, and I've received perhaps the most protest on was our inability to hold a traditional commencement. We're going to hold a commencement for the class of 2021 uh, in late April and early May. We're doing it then because we canceled spring break. And therefore we're stopping the semester a week early. And it will be a blend between a program that will be pre-recorded and shown on a large screen in our arena. And then smaller groups with a limited number of guests who will be able to cross the stage and receive their diploma, actually their diploma cover from the Dean of their college. And we'll do it over three days. So we're going to break it up into small groups and try to give everybody a chance to be seen uh, and be recognized and have their family celebrate a bit. We're going to set up some other stations around campus so that they can find some other ways to take pictures by some of, by the fountains and some other things that will remind them of their time at FGCU. We'll see how it goes. Uh, just so you know, our very first attempt at a virtual commencement, which we did last year, turned out not to go as well as we'd hoped because we outsourced the technology to a company that promised they could pull it off. And it had a few bumps in the road. But the vast majority of students and their parents adapted. And uh, I came to campus every day. And particularly on the weekends, I would find them with their regalia on, taking pictures various places, I met a family in front of a Lico Arena who had set up with their extended family a widely socially distanced picnic. And we're having a fine old time celebrating out in front of the arena, despite the fact that we couldn't let them in. So it, it, it's been interesting to see the degree to which students, their family, faculty, staff, neighbors, and others have picked up the challenge of dealing with a global pandemic. I've said this to a number of people uh, from my own personal perspective. And that is for me, it has not been as challenging or at least not as stressful as for others. Partly because I knew and I know that since no one's ever gone through or managed through a global pandemic, no one can tell you how it's supposed to be done. 
So it's pretty hard to criticize the way we're doing it. We're making it up as we go along, but people know that. So it isn't as though we're somehow being held to a standard uh, of how to manage a pandemic. There's some comfort in there. The other is that this is the very, very last uh, part of my career. And I have said on many occasions to people, the best job you'll ever have is the job you have when you don't need a job. And so it's been easier for me to get up and face the stress. The stress for me has been witnessing the stress on others, students, faculty, staff, and so on. And it has been, and you can feel it. You can feel the fatigue. And I'm sure in every place people are, wherever they are around this community and beyond, you feel the fatigue of trying to deal with isolation, with the fear of getting the, pan the, the virus, with waiting for, first of all, tests, and now most recently for vaccinations. Incidentally, we're vaccinating on campus. We did everybody over 65 who wanted a vaccination on campus. We're now dropping the age. Next week, we'll start going much more deeply into the demographics, including students. So all of those stresses have been out there. And as I suggest, it's probably easier on me because, uh, because of the position I'm in, the state I am in life, and the realization that we're doing the very best we can. And very good people have clearly risen to, to the challenges as I suggest we faced it. In my own case as well, I was here for the direct hit on this campus by Hurricane Irma in 2017. And through that, I got to know some of our people who work on uh, emergency response. So I knew their capabilities going in and our emergency response director. And uh, they have not let us down, every one of them, uh, from our safety people on campus to those people who had to organize the response. Our director of emergency response has been terrific. So across the board, it's been uh, fairly easy, even under these times, to be a cheerleader. I do think we're going to see some fundamental change across higher education. And certainly here in Florida and certainly here at uh, FGCU as a result of the pandemic. And let me share a few observations about that. As I think some of you may know, there was already a restructuring taking place before the pandemic. The decline in the number of high school graduates and a variety of other circumstances was causing a consolidation and to some extent an outmigration of higher education institutions. Uh, so that was a slow going process, but you could feel it, you could see it, you could read it regularly in the press. It's been greatly accelerated by the pandemic. This morning in the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education, there was an article published of a study that I think employment at universities and colleges in one year has dropped by about 8%. I think the number is close to 700,000 fewer jobs than there were just a year ago in higher education. It's happened probably more in the smaller privates with small endowments, but even among many publics, we're seeing a real shaking out as uh, for one reason or another, costs have risen, uh, revenues have not, and stresses have been created in such a way that they're shrinking and consolidating and merging, et cetera. Um, I think particularly for some of the publics of our nature, we've had some real stress in maintaining an athletics program. We're a mid-major without football. So we rely pretty heavily on revenues from basketball in particular. And when you can't put, uh, in our case, 4,600 people in the league arena, we've been playing when we've been able to play in front of about 800. It has a pretty massive impact on revenues and therefore our capacity to sustain the programs. We don't have the kind of money that many of the big boys, the 40 or so really big boys have. So that's been stressful. And I think we're gonna see some more impact of that. We've seen a few of our sister institutions begin to drop sports to cope with the fact that they think this is gonna be a long-term impact. So I think you'll see some consolidation. I think we're gonna see some change in the community in that um, we are more likely now to strategically use remote work than we were before. 
We know that there are many functions on the campus for which our professionals that carry on those functions need not be physically present on campus. Faculty do and those who support faculty do, but things like purchasing and payroll and HR and legal, our general counsel's office, uh, many of those we've discovered can be very effective working remotely. So it's gonna change the way we invest in and manage buildings. Uh, we had bigger plans to expand some additional space on campus for uh, offices. I think now we can forego that for some time to come as we think about carefully who we can assign to work remotely. So I don't think there's any question that's gonna happen. Uh, I think we're gonna think more about how we manage on a day-to-day -day basis to avoid uh, having the time to, to manage through this particular time and then think about the long-term fallout from this that's most certain to come. Because uh, I think we've now discovered that a lot of students who were going away to college may stay closer to home and it will change the distribution of the kind of students we attract and others attract. And uh, so I think that's clearly out, out there. Um, I think you're gonna have a harder time getting some people to enter university administration having been stressed out by this last year with some time to come. And I think we've seen, Chuck Upchella uh, may have a feel for this as well. A number of our colleagues who may have served a while longer as presidents or chancellors deciding that this has been enough and it's worn them out. So I think there's gonna be a greater out migration we're seeing it already, if you, again, look at the Chronicle and the like, um, and we're gonna have to find ways to attract people into roles they might not have taken otherwise. Among the positive things I've discovered out of this, not only are the good talent that we have on this campus and beyond, is uh, the value that we've had in being in a system. On several occasions, the system gave us air cover to make decisions we might have had some pushback on, but we could turn and say it was a system decision that had to do with commencement, among other things, masks, social distancing. Uh, we were able to collectively continually get input from the state surgeon general to give us the very best science we could get at the moment. That's been very helpful. We meet twice a week by Zoom, all the presidents, the chancellor of the system, one of those meetings, the chair of the Board of Governors, along with the chairs of every Board of Trustees. So we share two things, um, success stories and advice, and we vent to one another a bit, which is actually psychologically not a bad thing. So the system has been very good in this regard. Even though we're very different from one another, uh, we have been able to benefit from the experiences of one another. And I think it's made us feel much more like a system than just a collection of 12 universities. And in the long run, I think that will be a very good thing. We're gonna to have to continually emphasize that we're gonna manage institutions. If we ever have anything like this again, we're gonna to continue to have to focus on the science and not the politics. Because quite candidly, in all of this, politics have drifted a bit into the conversation. And people took sides over various things, as I suggested, mask mandate being one of them, based on political issues and ideological issues or whatever they were, and not followed what I believe to be the sign, what the science was telling us. It was a minor bump, but it was there, no question about it. And of course we did have the students who wanted to make the case, well, I'm only in college once, so I should be able to go out on Saturday night to the bars because that's what I'm entitled to. And we've had to find ways to manage that as best we could. So those are several of the things that I would share with you about what's going on and what's gone on at FGCU. We are intending, though I'm not making a promise here, we are intending that fall of 2021 will be much more like fall of 2019. We will be more face-to-face. -face. We will be back on campus more in, in larger numbers. We expect that the residence halls and we're getting evidence that people are putting down deposits are prepared to come back to a more normal circumstance. We
We will try to play our regular sports seasons. We will try to have intramurals and clubs and fraternities and sororities. We will hope that our students can continue to work in the community and not have to be overly concerned about their impact on our neighbors and their clientele. All of those things we are planning for, but everything we do now is conditioned on the continual phrase, it will depend where the pandemic takes us. And uh, so we try to remind people of that. The final thing I'll say, I think we've learned out of this is that if you want to keep people on board, students, faculty, staff, friends, donors, et cetera, I'm never sure, I'm not sure you can ever over communicate about what's going on. So we've had a steady stream of communications. I don't know how many video updates I've recorded and I'm sure people are pretty tired of them, but nonetheless, it's been our collective view that even telling people there isn't much to tell them is in some ways comforting that something isn't happening they don't know about. So we really understood early on that the communication process is just as important in many ways as the decision-making process itself. So Chuck, uh, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, it's been an interesting ride. I have made more jokes about myself in this. I think I told you once when I started, I was six, eight and had red curly hair and the pandemic has ground me down to about five, 10 and bald, but which isn't entirely true. But on balance, I've been impressed with what our colleagues have done around the country. And I've certainly been proud of what my colleagues on this campus have been able to do. Through a period of time, none of us had any idea what this was going to turn out to be a year and two or three months ago. Well, I want to thank you, uh, President Mike Martin. That was a very uh, detailed, I felt like I was right there with you through that, uh, what I'm sure was an ordeal, even though you described it as, uh, well, I could probably do this as well as anybody since nobody's had to do this before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, I wanted to ask you know, a, a question about technology and this, in this context, you mentioned there'll be a change maybe in where students decide to go to school. You know, before the pandemic, there was a lot of talk about how the cost of higher education was out of control. It was a serious issue then. It's still one now. We have students with all of the accumulated debt from student loans. And technology was seen at the beginning before this pandemic as a kind of a solution to that, or at least part of one. How has the pandemic impacted technology? Obviously, you have to use more of it, but what after? What about after yeah. the pandemic? Is it going to play a bigger role in how teaching and learning takes place on our campus? I think it will, Chuck. I think, I think, I think we will spend some time now looking at what we learned from the new pedagogical style to determine whether we have created, even accidentally, some greater learning opportunities and means to reach students with different learning needs. At the same time, which has been a very interesting to me is I've heard from a number of students and parents who said, we didn't discover how much we missed the more traditional experience. And I don't just mean in class, the traditional experience of being an 18 year old and going off to college. I, and I got a really interesting email. I pull it up every once in a while because, uh, you know, when we came up to spring break, to, to winter break, we were encouraging kids to go home but come back. But we did point out that our positivity rate on campus was one fourth the positivity rate in the community. So I would say to people, you're safer here than you are in Costco. Well, I got an email from a mom in Wisconsin who wrote me and said, my twins are at FGCU. Please don't send them home. <laughs> they're happy, we're happy, and we think they're safe. And so there was this notion that uh, they were enjoying the best we could give them. But I do think we're gonna see many more utilizations of technology to enhance rather than simply replace the more traditional approach. And I think that will be good. I'm not sure what it's gonna to mean to costs, but I do think it will be good from the standpoint that we're learning new ways that we can cause students to learn 
that we had not been forced to experiment with before. Great, we have a couple of questions in from the participants here. And one has to do with, I'm sure the announcement this week that Rutgers was going to require vaccine vaccinations of yeah. all returning students. So the question is, will you require all students and faculty to be vaccinated with exceptions as needed for the fall semester? Well, we we're gonna to wait to see. First of all, there's two pieces to that. One is, can, can is it possible for them to all be vaccinated if we did require it? I mean, will there be sufficient vaccines and enough distribution? And then the second, of course, is a legal question. And just uh, last night, night before last, we had our Zoom meeting of the presidents and the chancellors, and that's being researched on our end as well. Rutgers announcement kind of, I guess it didn't surprise me. I, I thought, it was a little early given what we know. If it turns out that the scientists and the experts we work with and we trust them uh, to do to give us good advice, uh, suggest that mandating vaccines and we can, then we likely will. But I think there's a long way to go yet. And I want to make two comments for people who or a, a, two compliments for people who live in this part of the state. We've had enormously good. Uh, collaboration with the two big hospital systems down here, uh, Lee Health and NCH. We've turned to their experts early on to give us the best advice on how to manage, and they were forthcoming and collaborative at, from day one and at 100%. So we'll go back to them. We'll go back to uh, Scott Ribkes, the uh, state surgeon, <laughs> and we'll ask the advice of the experts on if this would be a good, sound, safe, doable way to get the campus back to normal. There's another question, and I guess this one precipitated by some of the reports out of the elementary and middle school, post maybe uh, high school level, where students have been measurably hurt through the pandemic uh, in, insofar as their ability to learn. Uh, using technology and the hybrid model or the technology model. And what about at, at the GSU? I, I, I think that there are students who have had uh, some real challenges learning. And you know where we see it to some extent? We've seen a great deal more traffic and appeal to our student mental health counseling center. And a lot of it is the frustration and the fear and the anxiety that I'm not gonna be able to make it in this set of, this means of delivering or continuing their degree. We, we've seen a huge uptick. We just built, oddly enough, we anticipated this last October, a year ago, October, we opened a big new center for both community and student counseling. And thank God, because we had the elasticity to expand capabilities and much more online use. So I think there has been some displacement for certain kinds of students and for and there has been a great deal of anxiety even for those who may have been able to cope. And I think about it myself. I mean, I, if, of course, I hope that if, if I were 18 or 20 today, I'd be better at technology than I am. As I think you know, I write with a fountain pen and that's, I, I, I can just barely type. And I taught economics for 30 years and the last technological breakthrough I used to teach was colored chalk. So I'm a throwback. And, but if I had to be thrown back into that, it would cause great anxiety for me to try to utilize. So I don't think it's been without some harm. I think it's the best we could do, but I don't think it's been without some harm. And I do think there is, we're discovering the value of just casual face-to-face -face interaction with your peers that somehow gives you a more settled feeling about your time here. Um, and I hear it and also face to face. I, I, I get up when I come to work, I stop at the, our student union for a cup of coffee. Everyone knows it. They can come by and every day, some student or faculty or staff will come by and share either an observation, a recommendation, a complaint or an anxiety. And I'm not very good at handling any of them before a cup of coffee, but once I get there, at least I'm attuned to what they're telling me. So I think the answer to your question, the long answer to your, 
to that question is yes, I do think there's been some damage done. What about on the other side of the podium, a, a question here, uh, the impact on faculty. I mean, uh, there are some reports I've seen uh, in the Chronicle and elsewhere about faculty deciding to exercise early retirement because they don't want to deal with this. And of course, I know as a lecturer still, it, there's nothing like being in front of a live group of uh, people that have an interest in what you have to say. We've, at the Center for Critical Thinking, we've been struggling with just what is the right format. You have some people in the audience and the rest on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, what about the impact on, on faculty as teachers? I don't think there's any question it's had an impact. And we're seeing that's a combination of the fact that our senior faculty, mm -hmm. the original faculty, are arriving at that age when they can. But this may be the biggest year of retirements we will have ever, we have had in our 24 years. And one of the things we're trying to do, in all honesty, given the uncertain about the finances, is to delay any massive replacement of those faculty till we better understand where we're going to be fiscally, both from the legislature and then whether we'll have some fallout in enrollment. But I do believe that it's had a real impact on a number of faculty. Uh, I think we saw some mid-year retirements of people who simply were not comfortable coming back to campus, despite the fact that the campus by statistically was safe. I do think there are a number of faculty who said, I just can't do it. I'll take my retirement now. So I think we're gonna see a fairly substantial over the next couple of years, recharging of the faculty, but not because it was without the impact of the pandemic. Here's another question from a uh, participant. What is the university's plan to help students recover for those who fell back academically? This again, probably reflecting more of the, what we've heard about, every, all of us yeah. have heard about at the other levels of education, but I'm sure it's a factor at higher ed as well. Well, we certainly have working with our faculty and others to provide whatever accommodation we can to students who either had to take a W, decided they wanted to step back and wait till they could get back into it. Uh, we will continue to look at ways to supplement instruction for people to catch up. We're doing obviously trying to do more and more experiential learning so that students can get some benefit from getting back into the world and not just into the classroom. So all those things are under consideration and Hopefully we can make people uh, motivated to seek every way they can to catch up. Um, and, and, and not every faculty member is as committed, but the vast majority of our faculty are clearly committed to helping students achieve their educational objectives and go on to whatever it is, whether it's graduate school, professional school, or to a job with the highest possible capability. And I see them all the time. And, uh, so I think we can help minimize the damage and wherever possible, fix some of the damage that's been done. But there's a limited amount you can do. I mean, as you suggested, we can't keep them around a whole lot longer because it is costly in two ways, right? That they not have to keep paying, they stay out of the job market longer. And so one of the reasons why we were pleased with some of the uh, micro credentials we're doing is it's a way to enhance your capability as you're continuing to finish your degree. And one of the places that we've really been successful to date is with Arthrex in Naples. And uh, we've got a large group of students who are getting a little capstone extra education above and beyond their normal education here so they can enter that industry more effectively. And I think it's particularly important now. Well, given all that, I wonder too about uh, the the impact. One of the things we are concerned about in higher ed is graduation rates. Mm -hmm. I know we've only had a year of experience here with this, but it, who knows how long this might go on. Do you anticipate there'll be an impact on graduation rates going forward and in higher education generally, I guess I'm asking. Well, I, I think we've seen at least some number of students stop out or, or step down from full loads 
because they didn't either couldn't come to campus, they didn't want to come to campus, they couldn't afford to come to campus. You know, it's hard on us because we've had a full court press for the last three years on improving graduation rates. When I came on board in 17, we were at 23% four-year graduation rate. Today, we're at slightly over 40. <clears throat> Great work by a lot of people to really figure out ways to give every student the most expeditious path to a quality degree. I do think we're gonna fall back some. And you see it in the anecdotal, if not in the data, in the anecdotal evidence of students who just for whatever set of reasons just had to either step down or step out. And part of it's financial. You know, I think we're gonna see an uptick in the number of Pell students because families have taken a hit and they'll fall into the Pell eligible category after we've been shrinking that group. And I think that's a sign. Um, so, and I think again, because many of our students relied on working, particularly in the hospitality industry here, and it's been in some difficult times, they're facing stresses that may cause them to have to shrink their investment for the moment, both in money and time. So I think it'll have an impact. Uh, we're going to do all we can to try to minimize that impact. And we're working on ways to give students, uh, you know, if they want to stay over the summer and still find a job and we can help them out in any way. And, make sure the residence halls are available to them and we have sufficient support to make summer a more traditional semester. All those things are worth trying to do. Well, <clears throat> one thing I've personally wondered about is uh, watched all this from the safety of early retirement was <laughs> back when this started in, uh, in March uh, of last year. Uh, okay, you went to, uh, to all uh, distance learning. What about those classes then that have such large, that had large clinical components, yeah. all of the laboratory courses, chemistry, uh, laboratory sciences of all kinds. Uh, what did you do that year? And, and I know going forward, it's more a hybrid uh, solution. Yeah. But what about back then when you couldn't do any of it? We had, we had some opportunities to catch up in the fall. And particularly on the internship with our private partners, they understood that we had to delay some of that to get students out into the nursing practicum and the like. But they also were anxious to get them back because they knew they could be helpful in dealing with the pandemic. Uh, so it's not as we, we probably have set some students back in terms of catching up on their experiential learning and their connection to a specific need, <coughs> excuse me, to do a, uh, to, to do an internship and, uh, so we're gonna be looking at ways we can plug those back in comfortably as students come back, hopefully, to a more complete uh, curriculum. We did have some faculty, even though we're fully online, hold lab classes on campus for sections of laboratory. And we put up shields and we, we bought PPE and we, we had a lot of stuff, we spent a lot of stuff. And I wanna say this too, we, we, it was one of those rare occasions Initially, we had a really hard time finding disinfectant, right? It was in great demand. So one of our chemistry faculty, within about a week, developed, I think, a now patented disinfectant. And I told people it has three great uses. You can disinfect. If you're desperate, you can drink it. And if you have to, you can blow up a small building. So, so we've had some real success in, in innovation on campus because we had to invent our own to some extent going forward. But we used everything we could where it was absolutely necessity. And some faculty simply said, you gotta come in and do this lab. And we did, we allowed that. And the same for those uh, courses that required a clinical experience where yes. they had to go off to. A, yeah. Well, how did that, how was that affected? I mean, the students could no longer do that, I guess because everybody was shutting down or did they? That, well, there's some of each. I mean, it was shutting down, obviously. And that was tough, right? I mean, and we're hoping that uh, we can find a way to still certify under the various th kinds of accreditation. We got some relief on accreditation in particular in some areas because they couldn't do it. And, uh, and many places really worked to accommodate them. Uh, particularly, as I say, the two big health systems here really worked hard to give every student a chance to have the experience in one form or another. Uh, you know, we've got one of the big, prof biggest professional golf management programs for
for a while, they were really set back. Now suddenly there's a huge surge in the use of our students in the PGM program. Same is true in resort and hospitality management. It's just that there were, the businesses were going down. Right. So those people who wanted to go out and intern <laughs> at the Ritz-Carlton just didn't have that opportunity. So hopefully one way or another, we can give them the chance to get their foot in the door and, and get not only credit, but get the experience necessary that they can be successful. Here's another question from a participant who is asking, uh, have we seen enough uh, with the surge in the use of technology that we've had to go to here? Determine the cost comparison of remote learning versus in situ learning. Well, you know, it turns out at least from our initial, my initial assessment is that remote learning is not a whole lot less expensive than face-to-face. -face. First of all, you still have to have an instructor. Somewhere there has to be someone who produces the knowledge that goes into whatever the delivery mechanism. And this has forced us to build up a pretty substantial amount of expertise to support the technology and the technology itself. So I don't think, I think the only, the big advantage of technology is that the economies of scale are pretty large. You can put another student into a remote class at almost zero marginal cost, so to speak. So the scale gives you some advantages, but the core costs, so you can spread them more, but the core costs are still pretty high. And, uh, and I will tell you, I burn up a lot of our technological capability because about every third time I do one of these Zooms, I screw it up somehow. And somebody from our tech group has to come over with a mask on and do about two things in three seconds to get me back connected. So I've tried to minimize the time I'm using of the really good folks we have, but we, it, it has become more expensive in that regard. But I do think that there will, we'll begin to find where that equilibrium is between utilizing technology to cut costs while maintaining high quality of instruction. I thought that was a great question for a professor of applied economics. So, yeah. yeah, as you can see, I, can't, <laughs> I, I fall back on the lingo of the economist <laughs> when I don't have anything else to say at all. <laughs> well, here's a, here's a comment from one of the participants from Julie. It's, it's not a question, but a sincere thanks for sharing your time, experience, and thoughts with us. Uh, she thinks what educators like uh, you are doing is critical to the future. So you're figuring it out and uh, we know the future is not going to be the same. <laughs> well, that's for sure. And thank you, Julie. And, you know, as I say, I'm, I'm largely a cheerleader for really good people here. I, I think Chuck knows this from his own experience. Most of us who are university presidents learn that the best place you can learn to be a president is from Tom Sawyer, which is you get somebody else to paint the fence. And so my job is largely finding the right fence painters. And <laughs> I've been really proud of, uh, of the folks who have stepped up. And uh, we, we, there's an old group of us here on campus, and I mean old in our own uh, the, uh, chronology, who occasionally get together at a little pub on the campus over here for an afternoon beer. And to hear their stories of the successes that they're now taking pride in, that they would never have taken on before reminds me about the vast majority of great people who do this out of passion and not out of a simply because it's a job. And that's, that I think has got us through this. I think by and large is people who really care about the quality of what they do on behalf of students. I don't wanna get maudlin about this, but I really do believe that. And so we've had a lot of fun teasing one another because particularly those of us at the advanced end of this have been a little boggled by what we've had to do. But it's, it's a compliment to a lot of great folks, not just at this university, but across the academy. Well, it's certainly a great uh, joy and a privilege uh, that you have just articulated that I've certainly experienced. You get to work with a great big group of people that are very smart and they are dedicated to what they do. And it's just a matter of, okay, how are we going to do this? Let's get her done. Yeah. Um, the, um, see if I have another question here. Another question. Okay, we already covered that one. Well, I'm going to uh, add my thanks to you, uh, Mike, for your willingness to, to, to do this lecture for us uh, at the Center for Critical Thinking. We appreciate it more than you know. 
And I want to wish you uh, and the university the best in getting all the way through the rest of this. Uh, and we're, uh, we know we're going to continue to be proud to have uh, the Florida Gulf Coast as part of this uh, Southwest Florida community. So thank well, you again. Let and, me extend my invitation to anyone when you get the opportunity to come and visit the campus. If you haven't been here, it's a beautiful place. It really is. It's 800 acres, half of which is uh, conservation land. So there's interesting nature trails and it's, it's a lovely place to visit. And you're welcome to do that at any time because it belongs to this community. And we all know that. All right. Well, with that, we'll close. Thank you all the participants for being with us here today. And thanks to uh, Sephora Brown for her work and others to stage this, uh, this event. So with that, it's, I guess, goodbye and good luck. Go Eagles.